Uh, if you go ahead and get your Bibles out to Mark chapter 4, trust you brought your Bible with you, whether it's electronic or paper. <laughs> I brought my electronic one because I'm just used to that now. All the Bibles I got in my study, and I, I think I just use the computer now instead of all those Bibles. But I bought them through the years before there were computers, so hey, you know. And it looks really good as, you know, in the study there, it looks real intellectual. All righty, uh, let's pray and get started here this evening. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come together and rally around your word, receive from your word. Father, we just believe that the Word of God should be absolutely first place in our lives. Taking time as we do here to set aside to receive from the teaching of the Holy Spirit and the study of the Word of God is something, Father, I know that is, is high on your list for us to do to continue to grow and receive from you and to mature as believers. And so we thank you for this opportunity. I ask, Father, that the Holy Spirit just lead us and guide us in the direction you want us to go here this evening. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Mark chapter 4. One of my very favorite portions of Scripture. There's so much here. Matter of fact, I'll have to grab myself by my ear and pull myself and, and, and say, don't take too long. There's always another session. <laughs> and, you know, Brother J uh, John Osteen said many years ago that he had a revelation that the short-winded shall speak again. And uh, that was something it took me a while to learn, years, years to learn. But anyway, uh, there's just a lot here. So if I start heading off on rabbit trails, we'll just chase a few rabbits. Mark chapter 4, verse 1, talking about Jesus here, it says, He began again to teach by the seaside. And I think it's fairly clear from this particular beginning of this verse of Scripture, this was something Jesus did a lot. He began again to teach by the seaside. And I think that's because as the crowds gathered and started kind of pushing him down toward the edge of the sea, he got a little crowded sometimes. He, he, you know, he was pushed up to the edge of the water. So let's see what happens here as he began to teach. It says, There was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. So basically, I can kind of see it in my mind's eye that he was kind of getting pushed a little further down the beach and finally said, look, I'm just going to get in a ship. I'm going to go out and float, and everybody can just gather there on the, on the shore. And I'm sure that was a really neat venue uh, to have to hear the Word of God taught, praise the Lord, right there by the seaside. Uh, but in verse 2 it says, And he taught them many things. So I'm in good company being a little long-winded, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. He taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine. Now, the word doctrine throws a lot of people. They look at it as a religious context or, you know, this very high-sounding theological context. But, uh, context, but all, all it really means is teaching. He was teaching. Now, if you know anything about Jesus' earthly ministry, he did, primarily did three things, teaching, preaching, and healing teaching, preaching, and healing. He went round about the villages doing those three things. And here he's teaching them. Now, as a teacher, I love that. I don't get to preach very often. I've done it. It's a lot of fun. But I'm really a teacher, a line upon line, precept upon precept kind of guy. So I love the fact that he is teaching them here. He said unto them in his doctrine, hearken, pay attention, behold, there went out a sower to sow. So he's about to tell this parable to this multitude. And it is about something that they know a lot about because most of these people are either fishermen or they're farmers, for the most part. Now, you know, they've got other tradespeople there. Jesus himself was a carpenter, as was uh, his natural stepfather, if you will, Joseph, because God was his uh, actual father, you know, fathered him. But Joseph was his earthly father in that particular family, and he taught him the trade of carpentry. So there were all kinds of different, you know, uh, jobs that people had there. However, they knew a lot about farming. They were a farming and fishing society. So when he started talking about sower sowing, that was something that they understood readily. They, they got that. It came to pass as he sowed, 
this sower. Some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because there was no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, it was scorched, because it had no root, and it withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and yielded no fruit. Other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang, sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundred. Now this is the amount of increase. Some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, some a hundredfold increase. And he said unto them, now remember what he said when he started, hearken, pay attention. Then after he finishes, you know, this little story, he says, now, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And on first glance you think, well now wait a minute Jesus, you know all these folks, this whole crowd, they all got ears here on the side of their head. What do you mean ears to hear? I think that's really the point. Ears to hear and receive. What do we know about Romans 10, 17? So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now there's a lot even in that one verse. Faith comes by hearing. The word hearing there is the Greek word akoe, transliterated A-K-O-E, akoe. It means more than the mere sense of hearing with these ears, it means hearing and receiving the teaching. So it's not enough just to hear it. And I've, I know a lot of people, you know, when I was coming up in the Word of Faith message in the early, early 70s and, and 80s, uh, we got to be, and, and I've heard Pastor Ed use this term, we got to be tapeworms, meaning <laughs> we had cassette tapes and even before that, I'll date myself here, we had reel-to-reels. But anyway, <laughs> it goes back a long ways. But we had tapes, and we listened to these tapes, and we listened to these tapes. And I thought to myself, well, if faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, then what I need to do is just hear the Bible read. And so I got all these Bibles on tape, and I listened to the Bible being read. Well, come to find out that Romans 10, 17 is talking about more than just hearing it with the ears on the side of your head, just like... Jesus said here to this crowd, it's not just the people that hear it that get it. It's the people that hear it, receive it, understand it, and basically put it in action. Because it's, it's not enough to simply hear and know something. You've got to act on it. You've got to actually have it down in you. So, he starts teaching here. And he gives them this, and he says, let he, uh, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And then verse 10 is very interesting says, and he, when he was alone. Now, what that tells me is, this is after the meeting is broken up. The crowd's gone home. And he's pulled off to the side, you know, maybe, maybe he's going to prepare a meal, I don't know, uh, what they were doing there, but he was by himself except for a certain group. Now, immediately we think, well, yeah, of course, the disciples, the twelve, they were there with him. Well, yeah, that's true, but that's not all. Let's keep reading. Uh, when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him of the parable. So that tells me there were some people in that crowd that cared enough about what he was saying and thought it was critical, thought it was important for them to understand it. After the meeting, they came up to him and said, Jesus, what did you mean? What are you talking about? And so he had the twelve, and he had these folks that were serious about the Word of God. There you go. They were serious about the Word of God. They were putting the Word of God first place in their lives. What did he say to those people? He said in, uh, let's see, I'm going a little too far down the page here. When he was alone, they that were... Uh, about him with the twelve, ask of him the parable. He said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Now, you know, when I was in high school and I read this, I used to take my Bible to a study hall in high school, and I would read the Bible. That's pretty much what I studied when I was in study hall. <laughs> I didn't do much studying of actual, you know, math and science and things of that nature. But I was studying the Word, and I would read this, and I'd think, you know, 
I hate to say this, but Jesus is seeming a little uh, exclusive here, you know? It's like he's holding out. And I thought, you know, that's not the image of Jesus that I've got. Well, come to find out that whole train of thought is completely wrong. That's what I thought, and that's what I think a lot of people think when they read this, that Jesus was saying, well, it's given to you for you to know this, but those other guys, forget them. They're not going to learn nothing. But see, he's trying to explain a principle. He's trying to get across why it's for these people as opposed to the crowd. I want you to think about that crowd. They heard about Jesus. They heard about the miracles. They heard that these unusual things were happening. And they came out of what? Curiosity. He, you know, he was the rock star of his day. And just like you've got a lot of people that gather around, you know, just to see what's happening today, you had the same thing back then. They weren't serious about the Word. They didn't really care who Jesus was. They just came to see what's going on. But there was a subset of that group that were serious, did want to understand the Word of God, were serious about receiving from the Word of God, they didn't stop until they went to see Jesus and say, hey, what's up? What are you talking about? I want to understand this. All Jesus is telling them is, it's given for you to know this because you're hungry. It's given to you to know what I'm about to tell you because you persevered for the Word. You went after it. I like what I heard uh, Gloria Copeland she was teaching one time, and she was talking about receiving by faith, and she said that word that is translated in the particular verse she was looking at, to receive by faith, means to go after it, to seize it. It's a very active word. It's a very aggressive word. See, a lot of people don't think about aggressiveness when it comes to spiritual things. Everybody's just supposed to, ah, oh, you know, sit back and, float through life. It's just so nice and so sweet. But see, that's not... Jesus was not always nice and sweet in terms of outward expression. You know, there was a time he picked up a, uh, a strap, so to speak, and ran those guys out of the temple. And I'm sure people looking at him thought, boy, he doesn't look nice and sweet. No, he looked aggressive, but he was aggressive because if you read that verse of Scripture, it says, because of the zeal of the Lord... The zeal of the Lord. There is an aggressiveness for, the, for things of the Spirit. Now, I'm not talking about violence. I'm not talking about beating people up or anything like that. I'm talking about a determination. I'm talking about an aggressiveness of spirit to receive from the things of the Word of God. About putting the Word of God first place in your life. Not letting anything take the place of the Word. You know, a lot of people put a lot of time, effort, and energy to making sure they get to see a TV program. And there's nothing wrong with being a fan of a TV program. I, I watch several myself. But think about all the time, effort, and energy they spend making sure they don't miss that TV program. Either they DVR it or they rearrange their schedule or whatever to watch that program. But you ought to be just as determined to receive from the Word of God. Just as determined to receive spiritual things. And in their day... There wasn't any DVRs. <laughs> they couldn't say, well, we'll watch Jesus' message later on speakfaith.tv. You know? <laughs> no, we didn't have that back then. So they had to come and draw away with him privately and say, okay, Jesus, what's this about? What are you teaching about? We want to understand this. So he starts explaining. He says, unto you it's given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. So that tells me another thing here. This that he's about to teach is the mystery of the kingdom of God. Now, this is borne out later in this chapter. We probably won't get to it knowing how things go in terms of time because I am going to try to keep it as short as possible. But later on in this message, Jesus said that the seed principle was the principle by which the whole kingdom of God operates. The seed principle, which is what he's about to teach on. And basically, it is what Charles Capps calls the law of Genesis. Seed gets planted, seed produces after its own kind. And seed produces multiplied amounts, not just one seed produces another seed. I mean, what's the good of that? If one seed is going to produce one seed, just keep your seed. 
you know. That's not, that doesn't do you good. But we know that the way a seed works is you put it in the ground, it will grow and produce a plant that produces a lot of seeds that then you put those in the ground, they produce even more, and before too long you have 30, 60, 100-fold growth, exponential type of growth, because that's how seeds work, and that's how the kingdom of God works. That's how spiritual things work, is that tremendous explosion of growth. That's why God never just provides just enough. It's always way abundant, way more than you need. And so that's just the way spiritual things work. So that's the principle at work here. So let's keep going. It's given to you to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to them that are without, that are just curious, that aren't serious, all these things are done in parables. That seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear but not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven him. Well, let me ask you, wasn't Jesus' whole purpose to teach them and for them to hear and receive the word and their sins be forgiven and them be converted? Isn't that kind of the point? So it's not that he's against that. He's just saying those folks that are just curious, that aren't going for it, they're not going to receive it's you guys that are serious that are going to receive and hear and perceive and be converted. So that's pretty strong stuff. Now so far we hadn't even got down to verse 14, which is where most people start teaching on the sower sows the word, but I just want to give you all this background because it's good stuff. All right, verse 12. That seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest any time they should be converted and their sins be forgiven them. Verse 13, he said unto them, Know ye not this parable, or we'd say it this way, Don't you understand what I'm saying here? Don't you understand this story? How then will you know all parables? Or how are you going to understand any of my teaching if you don't get this principle? Now, see, to me, as a teacher, that, that caught my eye. That got my attention. If I can understand this principle, if I can understand this parable, I've got an insight into everything Jesus teaches. Well, that tells me this is critical. It is absolutely important. So, knowing that, he starts explaining the parable to these people that are hungry. Well, I count myself as among the hungry. <laughs> All right? So I want to know what this parable means. I want to have insight into the method that the kingdom of God works by. I want to know what this seed time harvest principle is. And so let's dig into it. Verse 14, the sower soweth the word. So the key thing we got, got to understand here is the sower is the farmer. He sows something into the ground, and we know that's seed. So the seed is the word of God. Now, if you're making notes, if you're not, well, praise the Lord, but if you are, <laughs> write it down and underline it. The seed is the Word of God. Make no mistake about it. You've got to define your elements here of this story in order for it to make sense. The seed's the Word, the sower is the farmer, the ground, here we go, the ground is the human spirit the human heart, the human spirit. So there's our definitions. The seed is the word. The sower or the farmer is the one who is teaching, preaching the word and receiving the word. And then the ground is the human heart, the human spirit. So the sower sows the word. These are they by the wayside where the word, which is the seed, is sown but when they have heard, now notice you're going to see in this process something very important, and that is they all heard. Remember Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They all heard the word. They all had equal and ample opportunity to get the benefit of this message. Jesus was not holding out on anybody. Now, see, that earlier verse made it sound like he was being real restrictive, but he wasn't. All he was doing was explaining that not everybody would hear and receive this. The people who were flippantly just listening out of curiosity, they didn't get it. 
the people that were going for it, the people that were aggressively pursuing the word, those are the ones that are going to get it. So he says to them, they all heard. Now as we go through, let you, you know, kind of in, in the back of your mind, let it light up when you see that seed, hearing, word principle. And let's keep going. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately. Notice he doesn't take a lot of time to make up his mind whether he's coming to take the word. He's going for that word. He's aggressively trying to stop you from receiving the word like you should be aggressively pursuing the word. Satan comes immediately. He doesn't just say, you know, I've got to get around to getting to that guy. No, he comes immediately. And what happens? He comes immediately and takes away the word, the seed, that was sown in their what? Hearts. Because remember, the heart is the ground. The heart is the ground. So, the word that was sown in their heart. These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, because themselves is the human spirit where the word is planted. The root goes into the ground, right? The ground is the human spirit. They have no root in themselves. Why? Because you are a spirit. You have a mind, will, and emotions. You live in a physical body. The real you is a spirit man. So he comes and he tries to steal it from these folks. And these folks, they have no root in themselves. They endure for a time. Afterward, when affliction... We'll talk more about that in a second. Or persecution arises. Why? For the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Now, you know, <laughs> if you listen to a lot of Christians, it, it, the way they talk, you'd think that Satan was just out to personally get them. Now, I'll tell you a story that, uh, this is a funny story, but <laughs> it, it actually happened. I was in a Bible study you know, in a person's home, and it was a nice little group. And before we would do the teaching part, we had a singing part. And somewhere around between the singing part and the teaching part, there was a testimony part. Hallelujah. <laughs> and this one dear lady, bless her heart, she said, oh, I'm having such a terrible time. The devil is out to get me. He's doing this and he's doing that. Oh, it's just so bad. Oh, brother, you've got to pray for me. It's just so bad. And, and the devil is just, is just tearing things up in my life. Bless his holy name. <laughs> and I went, whoa. <laughs> but you know, that's the thing. All of that talk about what the devil was doing was praise to the devil. Really? She was exalting what the devil was doing in her life. I didn't hear anything in there about, whoo, hallelujah, Jesus bore my sicknesses and carried my diseases, and by his stripes we were healed, and he became poor that I might be rich, hallelujah. And I didn't hear any of that. I heard the devil's getting me, the devil's beating me, the devil's doing this. Bless his holy name. <laughs> well, you know, I know she didn't mean it that way, but that's the way it came across. And it gave me something to think about. And the Lord, you know, kind of nudged me a bit. You know, hey, that's what she's doing. She's praising the devil. Well, you know, Christians ought not be praising their enemy. You know? And we shouldn't be exalting what he's doing in our lives to the point, well, it shouldn't be doing it at all, but particularly to the point that's all you're thinking about. And that's all you're talking about. And what you're saying is coming to pass. You're just digging a deeper hole. So I had to kind of, you know, it was kind of funny, but it was kind of sad at the same time. You know, it was one of those situations. I thought, oh, Lord, bless her, you know. And, of course, what do you do when you hear doubt and unbelief? You teach the Word. So that's what we did. We got in and taught the Word. But anyway. Uh, but let's go back and look at this. These folks heard the Word and immediately received it with gladness. Now, I want you to think about these folks. These are folks, man, they came out, they were excited, they heard a message, and they said, whoo, hallelujah, I can be healed. I can 
be whole in my life. I can get my needs met. Woo, they got excited. Heard that word of faith message. Praise God. And they received it with gladness. And if you'd have talked to them after the meeting, they'd have been out there going, ooh, this is the answer to all my problems. I am so glad I came to this meeting. But then what happened? They heard the word. They received it with gladness. They had no root in themselves. They didn't let it get down in their spirit. So in themselves is the spirit man. They didn't have root down in their spirit, so they endured only for a time. After that period of time, when affliction, now that word affliction in the Greek is the Greek word thalipsis. Thalipsis. It means pressure. And what Satan will do is he'll use all kinds of things to put pressure on you. It may be people. Very often, it's people. Particularly, sadly, your family or friends putting pressure on you. You know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do about that bill? What about your car payment? Why aren't you worried? My mom used to tell me that all the time. Why aren't you worried? I said, well, Mom, I'm turning it all over to the Lord. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm living by faith. Oh, man, what am I going to do with you? She said, you don't worry about anything. I said, that's right. <laughs> that is 100% right. And she'd say, what am I going to do with you? Because she was a champion warrior. I guarantee you, if you'd have had a contest, she'd have won. Because she was good at it. She was practiced in worrying. But the thing is, that's just pressure. It's pressure that comes against you. And we all, I don't care how long you've operated by faith, lived by faith, heard faith, taught, received faith, whatever, pressure comes. And you feel it. And it just, it's like a, it's like a force pushing in on you. Pressure. Philipsis is pressure. And Satan will bring this pressure and he'll bring persecution. Persecution, I've seen that even at work. I've, I had a guy come tell me one time, he said, you do realize that you being so openly Christian. I mean, people talk about coming out of the closet and being openly gay. That's the way it sounded, You're being openly Christian. <laughs> he said, you know this is going to affect your career. I said, How? He said, well, people are going to look at you and think you're strange. I said, I am. <laughs> he said, yeah, I know, but I mean, they're really going to think you're strange. I said, well, I don't like to necessarily look at it as strange, but more is peculiar. <laughs> he said, all right, yeah, you got that down too. So I told him about the scripture where it says we're peculiar people. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll cop to being peculiar. <laughs> so, but I knew what he meant. I said, well, you know, I'm not sure I fully understand where you're coming from here, but I'm going to be a believer wherever I am, whether it's work or out on the street or at home or whatever, I'm a believer. And he said, well, I'm just trying, you know, I'm your buddy. I'm trying to help you here. You just need to tone it down, you know, just kind of go easy. Uh, you know, and I said, well, give me an example. He said, well, you're always so uh, happy. I said, so I should stop being happy? No, 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 no. That's not what I mean either. It, it, you're, you're always so positive. I said, so I should be negative. No, 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 that's not what I mean. You know what I mean. I said, well, no, actually I don't. He said, well, what if what you're doing and what you're saying keeps you holds you back in your career. I said, well, A, I don't believe it'll do that. You know, God, I, I operate in favor. I, I believe for God's promotion. So I don't believe that's going to happen. But even if it did, even if this was a place that was hostile to me as a believer, uh, I'd just find a better job in a place where, you know, that didn't happen. But you, you mean if you got fired, you, it wouldn't bother you? I said, well, you know, in the natural, sure. There's going to be some pressure and there's going to be some issues there, but God's got a better job for me. If I get laid off from here because of my beliefs, whoo, he's going to, oh my, he's going to bless me. He said, there you go again, being positive. <laughs> Nothing I can do for him, <laughs> you know, other than just be that way, you know, right in front of him. But that's just where we should be as believers. It's just, just be a believer right in their face. 
you know. I like what I heard Gloria Copeland say one time. She was talking about uh, that, you know, Christians tend to be kind of, you know, they're always so self-aware they don't want to say anything that might offend anybody. And, you know, you don't want to say something that might imply that you believe the Word of God in a different way than they do. And so you're always so accommodating. She said, you know, I quit doing that. I just decided I'm going to talk to them just like they understand it, absolutely where I'm coming from and that I'm believing God and everything I'm saying. They've already heard all the teaching. I'm just going to act like they're believers too. And she said, you know, for the most part, most of them don't ever say anything. They may look at me funny, but they don't ever just, you know, say, wait a minute, and take me to task. They just let me talk. So that took, took a lot of the pressure off to just go ahead and be a believer right in front of them and talk to them like they were a believer. Again, sh you know, being aggressive, not aggressive, you know, in manner, but aggressive in faith. That's what I'm after. Aggressiveness in just being a believer right in front of everybody. And God rewards that. He said that those that deny him in public, he would deny. Well, <laughs> I tell you what, I ain't going to be one of them. <laughs> I'm going to be one that say, oh my, he's a believer. Yep. <laughs> All right, well, let's keep going here. Remember, these folks were stony ground. Why were they called stony ground? What does that conjure up in your mind, stony ground? Remember, the ground's the human spirit. The ground's the heart. Hard, hearted. The Lord showed me that as I was studying this, and I thought, hard hearted, ooh. Ooh, yeah. Hard-hearted folks. See, they receive it with gladness. They're excited about what they hear, but really they're hard-hearted. They're set in their ways spiritually. That's not the way we heard it at first whatever, church. My grandpa didn't teach it that way. Well, maybe your grandpa was wrong. I know you probably would never imagine that was true, but, you know, he... He might not have really gotten it. Now, praise the Lord, there's a lot of folks way back in the past that were spiritually just sharp as a tack when it comes down to it. But, I, you know, I came up Southern Baptist. And Southern Baptist, I tell you, bless their darling hearts, they know a whole lot about salvation, getting people born again. But, you know, I wouldn't go to a Southern Baptist and ask them about the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. Because I guarantee you they'll have an opinion but it won't have anything to do with Scripture. <laughs> okay, I know from experience, let me tell you. Because I found out real quick, that's of the devil. No, it's not. It's in the Bible. Look it up. Anyway, so hard-hearted people that are just set in their ways. You know, Brother Hagin, a long time ago, made the statement. He said, yeah, folks are a lot like concrete, thoroughly mixed up and well set. <laughs> and I thought, yep, <laughs> hard-hearted. They're mixed up, they're just set in that. And so these are the people we're talking about here. They have no root themselves because they're just hard-hearted. It's not getting down into their spirit. After when the pressure comes and the persecution comes, for the word's sake, and I was talking about the lady that was glorifying the devil, like the devil was out to get her personally. The devil's not out to get you personally. He could care less about you. I hate to shatter your illusions, but you're just not that special. The devil could care less. But I tell you what he does care about, and that's the Word of God. It is his mission to stop the action of the Word of God whenever possible. Isn't that what we saw up here? Satan cometh immediately. He is obviously highly motivated to stop the action of the Word of God in your life. Now, how does he do that? this pressure and persecution, comes and puts pressure on you, and that causes the Word of God to become ineffectual in your life. Now, the Word of God didn't lose any power. What gets, what's made ineffectual is your perception, your receiving, and your operating and confessing the Word of God. That's what gets affected by the devil doing this. So he comes immediately... Because of the word, for the word's sake, 
and immediately they are offended. Now, let, here's a little side journey. This is one of our rabbit trails, so we'll chase that rabbit for just a minute here. <laughs> and that's this. Offense is very dangerous to you as a believer. Offense. Now, a lot of what Pastor was teaching on this, uh, this past Sunday, if you follow the thread of the issues that people had about what he was talking about, a lot of them was because of offense. They got offended, fold their arms and say, I don't like what Pastor said. Well, what did he say? He said this, that, and the other. Well, isn't that what the Word says? Well, yeah. <laughs> but I'm still offended because of what Pastor said. Well, it seems to me you're offended at the word. Don't be offended at the delivery boy. And I say that in all love, okay? Because <laughs> I know pastor and I know he'd be fine with being a delivery boy, all right, <laughs> of the word. But don't get offended at him because he's teaching the word of God in an uncompromising fashion. And see, that's the thing. What these folks want him to do is pull punches. Right. Amen? You know, well, now, brother, yeah, teach that the word is the answer, but not too much. Teach that confession is important, but, but let's not get legalistic on it. See, come on. Amen. We got to go for it. We got to get serious. Yeah, you know, I'm one of those pastor talks about that was a confession beeper. Back in the day, I was a proud confession beeper. You know, now I know there's wisdom, but I didn't have any. <laughs> you know, I was young and dumb. And there's a time when being young and dumb is, you know, you're young, you're dumb, you don't know. And so there I was. And somebody would say, well, that just scared me to death. That's your confession, and I believe every word of it. Oh. People get all bent out of shape with me. And I would go... Yeah, I told them. <laughs> you know, well, that doesn't help anybody, really. But the point is, I was serious about confession. I was serious about the words of my mouth. And I thought everybody else should be just as serious about the words of the mouth. And I tell you what, I like something else I heard Pastor say recently, fairly recently. He was teaching along, and he said, it's time we started getting serious about our confession again. Get a little more of that rambunctiousness to really watch our words because I'm telling you folks what you say is what's going to come to pass in your life that's just the way it works you know a lot of people say I don't like that well I don't care that's the way it works you know if I take a ball and I drop it it's going to fall that's just the way it works gravity is there the law of gravity is the law okay words and what I say coming to pass that's just the way it works so I can say all day long, I don't like that. I don't want to watch my words. Well, tough. You're going to reap the consequences. So we might as well get in line with that. I will never forget studying the verse of Scripture where it says, Life and death is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And the Lord stopped me as I was reading that and said, Love what? And I said, What, Lord? <laughs> Love what? I said, uh, the tongue? I'm trying to parse the sentence to try to figure out what he's saying. He said, no, 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 not exactly. The process of speaking words and them coming to pass in your life. Let's look at it. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it, the process of words speaking words, having them come to pass, shall eat the fruit of their words. Basically, those that plant the seed of the word with their mouth, because you speak it, it goes into your human heart, which is the ground, it comes up and takes root, and you'll have the fruit thereof of your confession. So what he said in this to me was, as he was talking about it to me, he said, you got to love the process. He said, a lot of my people don't love the process. Matter of fact, they're kind of mad about the process. And I've been there. Where I've said, now Lord, why couldn't you have made it whatever you write down? Why couldn't you have made it whatever I hide under my pillow? 
something, but my words. I just have such a hard time with my words. He said, son, you've got to love the process. Now, see, once I got that little tiny revelation, I began to understand he didn't make words important because he wanted to whip us on the head, you know, and knock us around and make our life hard. No, he gave us this so that it would be a blessing to us. I mean, after all, he created the whole universe with words. He said, light be, and light was. Slung it out there at the speed of light in every direction from his mouth. And then Jesus spoke to the fig tree, and it withered and dried up within a period of time. He used words to effect. Do you think he liked the system? Yeah, I think he did. That's why I think he, he took the disciples aside and said, now boys, let me explain this to you. Here's why words are so important. And then proceeded to teach them in Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, so forth. We've heard Brother Hagin teach it on and on and on. And it's important. That's the whole point. You've got to love the process. And once you get a hold of the process and understand the importance of the process, you do begin to appreciate it. And you start saying, wow, Lord... You gave me the ability to call into Pat, to call to pass my future. You gave me the ability to frame my future right ahead of me. Whatever I say out there starts coming to pass. It, it just keeps rolling in on every wave. Woo! That's exciting. So no longer do I look at it as all oh, why words. I look at it and go, man, I'm glad it's words. I'm glad he gave us means to do something in our lives, to straighten things out according to the Word of God. But we got to do it. That means talking. It means speaking the Word. So we got to get a, a hold of it and go with it. All right, so they get offended. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the Word. Notice they all heard the Word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things. Note those three things. Write those down if you're making notes. Cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, lusts of other things. If they enter in, they will choke the word, and the word will become unfruitful. Mark 4, 19. That's where we're at. The cares of this world. Now notice the cares of the world. Are you going to be able to make your car payment? Sister Susie's in the hospital. What am I going to do about this hospital bill? That's the care of the world. That will come against you and create pressure. Deceitfulness of riches. You know what the primary deceitfulness of rich, riches is? That riches will fix everything. Amen. That's what people think. I don't care if they don't have two pennies to rub together. They think that if they had enough money, everything would be fixed. Well, let me tell you something. If you're laying in the hospital dying of cancer, and the doctors have written you off and said, well, you've been through chemotherapy, you've been through uh, all the drugs, we've done everything we know to do, son, that's it. It's all she wrote. Ship your saddle home. And you're laying there in bed going, oh, Lord, if I had enough money. No, if you had more money, it wouldn't help you. The doctors have done everything they could do. But now, I can get you this book. Okay? And if you read this book and do what it says do, and, and operate in the, according to this book, you can get healed. Really? What book is that? Is it a bestseller? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It is the bestseller of all time. Wow. And then I pull out my Bible. Oh, that thing. That thing? Do you hear what they're saying? They do not hold the Word of God in high esteem. They diminish its authority in their lives. This is what the world is doing. This is what the devil's doing. He is trying to diminish the authority of the Word of God in our lives and in the lives of the world. Oh, well, that Bible, it's full of contradictions. I've told people before, I said, bring me one, just one. I challenge you, just bring me one. Oh, I could bring you several. Well, then do it. 
Write me letters, folks, on the Internet. Send me emails. Do whatever it takes. Show me a contradiction. Now, here's the thing. I guarantee you, whatever it is you try to show me, if you take the original text and compare it with other scripture in the original text, all will be explained. Amen? There's nothing in there that's a contradiction. Now, the world takes that as a given. They will tell you it is a truth to the highest degree, gospel, that the Bible is full of contradictions. And I always tell them, just show me one. Just one. One. And nobody's ever taken me up on it. And I'm on Internet. I'm on TV, on the Internet. All this kind of stuff. Nobody's shown me one yet. I've had a few people try. Well, what about so-and-so? What about Job? Give me a break. I got a whole tape series on what about Job. Okay, go look it up. Taught back in 1980. <laughs> We've known what happened to Job. He operated in fear. He spoke against himself. You know, it had nothing to do with God opening up things to him. He opened up his own problem through his mouth. You know, come on. You know, well, what about where the Bible said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, here's the thing. That is absolutely accurately reported. It is 100% accurate that Job said that. He was wrong. <laughs> but he said it. Well, that's what the Bible says. No, the Bible reported what Job said. Get your facts straight. Job said, the Lord giveth. Well, that's true. The Lord does giveth. And the Lord taketh away. No, he doesn't. What? If the Lord taketh away, he's a thief. If he's a thief, then he comes to kill and steal and destroy. If that's the case, he's the devil. So it wasn't talking about God. No, Job said that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, he said right that he gives, and he said right that he should be blessed, but he was wrong about the taking away. It was Job getting in fear and operating in fear that caused all of that to occur in his life. And then later on when he got himself straightened out, when he finally had a revelation and said, Oh, Lord, I have erred. Teach me to hold my words. And then got straight and set all these other guys straight and prayed for them. He got back three, four times what he had before and was totally and 100% blessed in every way. And who did that? That was God that did that. So see, again, the things they like to throw up and say, see there, see there. No, you got to see there what the Bible says. And that's because you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. If, if the Bible tells us we're to rightly divide the word of truth, that means it can be wrongly divided. Okay? There are people out there wrongly dividing it. There are people out there telling us you don't have to believe God, you don't have to confess the word. You just sit back on the couch and consider the Lord all day long and it'll all just fall on you like ripe apples off a tree. Let me tell you the Truth here, folks, it ain't ever happening. Now, Satan may let you slide a little while so that you'll be convinced that that teaching is correct. But see, that's how deception works. You don't, you don't tell somebody a lie and then immediately come around and say, oh, I, no, I was lying. No, you convince them of the reality of that thing. You really, boy, you pour it on. And he may lighten up on people for a while and say, see there? You're being blessed, you're being blessed, you're being blessed. And then one day when the hammer comes down, and they're going, I don't understand, why did this happen? And Satan's back there going, <laughs> See, he's, he, he is good at what he does. You know, somebody was <laughs> talking to Brother Hagin one time, said, you're just, you know, kind of like what they said about me, being so positive. He, they, he said, you're just so positive. You got something good to say about everybody. He said, I bet you'd even have something good to say about the devil. And Brother Hagin just, you know, just kind of leaned back and said, Well, you do have to admit he is persistent. <laughs> and that's the truth. If nothing else, he is persistent. Okay? Not in a good way, but you know, hallelujah. Well, we ought to be persistent too, but persistent on the word. 
All right, these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, cares of the world, deceitfulness, riches, lust of other things, entering in. It's got to enter in. If it doesn't enter in, none of this will hurt you. He can throw all this at you. He can throw cares of the world at you. He can throw deceitfulness of riches at you. Lust of other things, all of that. But if it doesn't enter in, it won't choke the word. The word will continue to grow and develop in your life if you don't let it enter in. Amen. That means don't meditate on it. Don't repeat it like the lady going over and over and over everything that Satan was trying to do to her. No, you don't rehearse that. You rehearse the answer. Now, I like what I heard a friend of mine say, Brother Ted Potts, many, 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 many years ago, back in the early 70s, when we had a Bible study. And he was teaching along one day, and he said, all right, he said, everybody, whatever you do, do not think of a pink elephant. And everybody went, <laughs> and they grinned a bit, and he said, what'd you think of? You thought of a pink elephant, didn't you? Even I told you not to think of a pink elephant. You thought of one, didn't you? They all went, oh, uh, yeah. He said, that's the way it is. If I tell you not to think about something, that's not enough. I got to tell you, don't think about this, but think about this. You got to replace the bad thought with a good thought. Well, what is good and pure and of good report? The Word of God. So I take the pink elephant out and I put in the Word of God <laughs> to kind of follow the example. So don't try to not think about what the devil's, you know, doing. Oh, okay, I'll just try not to think about what he's trying to do. No, don't worry about that. Think about the answer. Meditate on the Word. Rehearse in your mind all the scriptures that have to do with your deliverance from whatever that thing is. And you'll replace in your thought life what Satan's trying to get you to meditate on. Okay? That's just a little, a little tip. All right, the cares of the world, deceitfulness, riches, like I said, deceitfulness, riches, the primary thing is that riches will help you out of every situation. They won't. Now, riches are fine. God wants you to be blessed. But that's not the answer to everything. And then lusts of other things. The word lust is, is a word from the Greek that means inordinate desire. Did you know there are ordinate desires? In other words, legal ones? Oh, there's that word law again, Brother Bill. Well, yeah, law is perfectly fine. Matter of fact, the word commandment, I love this, over there in 1 John when it, where it talks about that we ought to be obeying the commandments, talking about New Testament ones, not the Old Testament ones, but New Testament Jesus commandments. Okay? We ought to be loving those commandments. The word commandment there simply means a prescription, just like a doctor's prescription, from a position of authority. Now you think about that doctor. You go to him and he pokes and prods and runs some tests, and then he says, oh, you got the zumma dumma zumma, whatever it is. And you go, oh, really? Well, what should I do? Well, you, you, I'm going to write you this prescription. You take this prescription in the drugstore, and you do exactly what I tell you to do. Take this pill this many times a day, so forth, and then come see me in about three weeks. Okay. So you take that prescription. As you walk out of the doctor's office, do you say, I hate this. I shouldn't have come here. He gave me this piece of paper. I, I just... Uh. No, you're glad to get the answer. You're glad to get that prescription, and you take it to the drugstore, and you pay that ridiculous amount of money for those drugs, and you take them just exactly like you're supposed to, and guess what? The infection clears up. And you go back to the doctor, and you're feeling good. Infection's all gone. And he says, well, I can see you took the prescription exactly as I told you to take it, and you got the results. Way to go. Now, was that painful? No. It was the answer to the whole situation. So you end up talking about, I'm telling you, I got a good doctor. He told me exactly what I knew to do, gave me a prescription, and it worked. And you're just shouting his praises. So why is it that when God gives us an authoritative prescription for our life, we aren't doing the same thing. We're not saying, whoo, that sounds great. I'm going to go out and do that because it's going to fix everything. See, that's the attitude we ought to be having toward commandments. Commandments are not bad. That's what the Word says. It's not 
hard to do. It's not something that is difficult to obey in a commandment if your heart's right. Okay. Boy, I'm getting off on rabbit trails. Here we go. Back to the word here. Okay. Mark 4, uh, 20. I'm going to try to close on this. These are they which are sown on good ground. Notice a lot of people when they teach this, they're thinking only about the ground, not the seed. The seed is the word of God. And the word contains within it the power to cause that word to come to pass. That's a long teaching. That would take a long time to go into. But basically it's from Luke chapter 1 where Mary was talking to the angel. And the angel came with a word from who the Lord came with that word and told Mary, hey, you're going to conceive a child and he's going to be called the Son of the Most High. She didn't say, I don't believe you. She just asked the question, all right, sounds good, but <laughs> how's it going to happen since I don't know, I've never known a man? I'm a virgin. Just curious. She wasn't in unbelief. She was curious. And so she asked the angel, what about this? How's this going to work? And the angel said in the King James, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Now that sounds good, and it, it's true, but there's so much in that verse of Scripture. Do you know the word rhema is in that verse of Scripture? Wow, the spoken word of God. What's it doing in that Scripture? Well, if you dig into the meaning of what the angel said, it actually says in the Greek, no word spoken by God, rhema, is void of the power required to bring that word to pass. That's all in that one little scripture. Wow. That's why I love Greek study. Because you've got to dig into it to see what it's actually saying. And if you want to, go look it up in the Amplified and see what the Amplified says. It will give you that meaning from that little scripture that says, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Now, with God nothing shall be impossible is not a word-for-word -word translation, but it carries the gist of the meaning of that Greek phrase. But the Greek phrase is what's so enlightening. No word spoken by God is void of the power required to bring that word to pass. So, going back to that, the word of God is only made of none effect if all these things enter into your heart. So if you will protect and guard your heart, then the word which contains the power to cause whatever it says to come to pass will work in your life. And that's what happens in the case of these good ground folks. These are they which are sown on good ground. They hear the word, so they all heard it. They hear the word and uh, they receive it. So that goes back to the meaning of that Greek word echoe. It implies more than just hearing, but hearing and receiving the teaching. See, this is what I love about the word when it all comes together like this when all of these different scriptures come together in one thought. They hear the word, they receive it, and they bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold and some a sixty and some a hundredfold. And he said in them as a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick, for there is nothing hid that shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. In other words, there's nothing that will be hidden from you if any man has ears to hear. Let him hear. So he, go, he wraps it all the way back around to his first statement that the important thing is it's up to you whether you receive it or not. It's up to you whether you're aggressively trying to pursue the Word of God, aggressively going after an understanding of God's Word and what he's trying to get across to you, what he's trying to teach you. Then he says, the very next verse, and we'll try to close with this one, I promise. Mark 4.24, he said unto them, Take heed what... You hear, for with the measure you meet, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. Perfect place to end this. Take heed what you hear. Now over in the book of Luke, when it was reported what he said in this message, it said, he said, take heed how you hear. Take heed what you hear. Take heed how you hear. I believe he, he said both of those things in this teaching. Because those are the two things we need to look at when it comes to hearing things. I can't always keep from hearing something negative. I live in a world that is surrounded by negativity. 
I hear it on the news. I hear it from people at work. I hear it from friends. I, hear, I read it in Facebook. <laughs> oh, man. Negative, negative, negative. So I can't always take heed what I hear in terms of being exposed to it, but I can take heed how I hear it. Do I hear it and say, yes, that's right? No. I hear it and say, no, the Word of God says. See the difference? That's taking heed how you hear it. It's one thing to keep from hearing anything, be like the monkey, you know. <laughs> See no evil, hear no evil. <laughs> you know, you don't always have to keep yourself from hearing. That's good if you can. I mean, I wouldn't sit around and watch stuff on TV that takes your faith out, you know what I'm saying? But if you happen to be in an area where you hear something negative, you can take heed how you hear it and say, now, Lord, I know that what they're thinking, what they're saying, but I know what the Word of God says. The Word says this and this and this and this, and that you use that as an opportunity to build yourself up on what the Word of God says about it. So, take heed what you hear with the measure you meet or in the attention that you give to it, it shall be measured unto you and unto you that hear and receive and understand shall more be given, more revelation of the Word. The amount of time you spend on the Word, the amount of attention you spend on the Word, the amount of energy, if you want to put it that way, that you spend on the Word, that's how it's going to return to you. And you're going to get more revelation. See, I was talking about how when I was reading and studying, the Lord will just drop something in my heart like that. That one little verse. You've got to love the system. It is an offhand comment. You know, the Lord will do that sometimes. He'll just make an offhand comment, and you go, oh, wow. And since then, I've meditated on that offhand comment, and I've got a whole teaching series out of that offhand comment. But see, why? Because I'm aggressively pursuing. If I'd just been kind of casual and kicked back and said, yeah, Lord, say on, whatever, you think I'd have meditated on it and got it? No. I'd have been thinking about that TV show I want to go home and watch. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with a TV show. But my attention should be on the Word of God. That is why I am so excited and so enthusiastic about this church, a place you can come and hear the Word of God taught in an uncompromising fashion, and a pastor that cares enough to tell us the truth if it hair lips the devil in half of North Carolina. Okay? I like that. You know, I like it when he starts teaching and he gets right on my toes and just stands there and grinds me. I'll say, yes, sir. I'll tell you the truth. I'm going to close my laptop. Seriously, I was sitting in here. Matter of fact, I think I may have been videotaping. And I would tape, you hear that? Videotape, like we use tape anymore. Showing my age. Anyway, so, but I was, I was shooting the video and uh, thinking about some things going on at work. And, and I, you know, to be honest, I was kind of mad about some things going on at work. I was, I was, I was distressed. <laughs> And I had decided that come Monday morning, I was going to go give them a piece of my mind. And I was going to tell them exactly what I thought. And I was actually kind of looking forward to it. I was a little bit excited about it. Come Monday morning, I'm going to go tell them. And Pastor is teaching along, and I'm recording. And he doesn't point at me, but he just says, as he's preaching, yeah, somebody here is about to go to work and say something, you're going to lose your job. I went, really? <laughs> okay, maybe I better rethink this. <laughs> you know, my pastor spoke into my life something that arrested me, and I told Belinda as I went home, I said, you know, pastor got all over me and told me in no uncertain terms, I shouldn't go into work and do what I was going to do. And she said, I don't doubt it. <laughs> you know, wives often know what you should and shouldn't do, even if they're really kind and gentle and don't always tell you, you dummy, you. So I, I thought, well, hallelujah, I'm just going to be kind and gentle and nice and not say anything. And you know what happened? That whole situation I was bent out of shape about just straightened right out. 
no problem. Everything worked together for good. <laughs> Everything worked itself out. And you know what happened after the fact? A couple of guys got in trouble because of what they did. Insubordinate, they called it, because of what they said. What happened with me is they thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread because I was willing to work within the system. And I'm sitting there going, you have no idea. If I'd have done what I wanted to do, I'd have been on the chopping block with these guys. But no, instead, I listened to my pastor who was giving me a word from the Lord. Now, he didn't call me out and say, Brother Bill, thou art about to lose thy job. But I was paying attention to the Holy Ghost who was speaking through my pastor, who was speaking into my life what I needed to hear at that very moment. And guess what? It saved my job, and not only that, I ended up getting promoted. Now server engineer, level three. Hallelujah. Which is as high as you can go without being a manager, which, believe me, that's, that's it, because I ain't going to be a manager. Anyway, <laughs> I don't deal with managing humans. I would prefer dealing with the equipment. <laughs> that's just me, okay? So anyway, the point is... We have such a blessed situation here to receive from the Word of God. This place ought to be jam-packed full of people who are looking for answers in life, because I'm telling you, the answers are here. They are here. So we ought to be aggressively telling folks, i got to tell you, you need to come to my church, because my pastor will tell you what the Word says, and it will change your life. And I'm not talking about just getting born again. That's great. I'm not talking about just getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's great. You know, all these things, getting healed, all these things are awesome. I'm talking about also wisdom of what to do in life, how to manage and maintain things in your own personal life to where you will be blessed and you will be ahead and you will be the head and not the tail, above only and not beneath. Blessed in the city, blessed in the country, blessed in everything that I do. That's what I expect and that's what I live and that's what I shoot for. And I'm right where I need to be to do it. Hallelujah. Well, did you get anything out of this tonight? Whoo, I sure did. I tell you what, I, I done taught myself happy. <laughs>